I'm Dina Tom. I'm a pediatric hospitalist at university and one of the UT faculty. And one of the things I'd like to point out is a common theme that I have, you know, in listening to everyone and then being the final person to speak and wrap things up, is what I find so beautiful is that whether you believe it's kind of divine intervention or just your own heart's way of finding purpose in seemingly insignificant events throughout your life, every story here today, and including my own, you see little pieces from like childhood all the way up and things that just reaffirm the purpose that you feel deep in your soul of what you're supposed to do to give back to others, which is the beautiful part of medicine, right? So um, I'm a pediatric hospitalist and like probably most people in our, you know, in all these different professions and as a doctor, we tend to be very confident in ourselves. I think I picked the best specialty. I think it's the best, right? Um, I make my own schedule. I get to rotate between different services of sedating sick children to prevent pain, see children who are admitted to the hospital and take care of happy, healthy newborn babies. I make my own schedule. I teach medical students and residents. Um, I get to do pretty much what I want to do on any given day that I want to do it, which is wonderful, and be a mom and be home on time and do all those wonderful things too. So subconsciously, I'll tell you that I knew I was going to be a pediatric hospitalist at the age of four. Um, and maybe that's just the first sign I felt, you know, divine sign. Because um, it was the first night I spent the night in a hospital. First time I had spent the night in a hospital. Um, and it was fabulous, okay? I ate jello and I watched cartoons and the nurses doted on me, and I slept in a very comfy bed next to my brother who was the patient, okay? And it was wonderful, and I wanted to go back to the hospital every day, and I told my parents I loved the hospital, okay? So 31 years later, <laughs> you know, I, this is what I do every day, and I still love the hospital. Consciously, though, I will tell you that I it wasn't going to be a doctor. Like, I, it never crossed my mind. Neither of my parents graduated college. No one in my family was in healthcare. Um, I had a single mom and was the oldest of four children. And going to college wasn't even something that was discussed. So when I told my parents I wanted to go to college, the, you know, they were like, that's great. How are you going to pay for that? So, you know, like all great romantic stories, I met a wonderful man in high school. And um, he's my husband now. We, I met him at 15. We went to prom together. And he was going to college. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I want to go to college. Um, and so I followed. So these are just like other things, right? Like these divine things that lead you to where you're supposed to be. Um, and I followed him to UT. And I went to, you know, college and started out knowing I wanted to help people. I probably wanted to teach. Then I dabbled in some psychology. Then I went to the School of Nursing and got in there. And then I realized that I really felt more like medicine in be, as being a physician was what I, where I wanted to end up. I wasn't great, at, you know, my grades weren't great. Um, I wasn't academically very strong. I came from a background of kind of uneducated, an uneducated family. So it took a long time. Then I met David Jones, who was the admissions dean here in the medical school when I was at UT. And he was like, you need to do research, you need to volunteer, these are the things you need to do. And I did it took two, uh, two years after, off after college and worked at a biopharmaceutical company where they allowed you to put your name on patents, which is fabulous. I have like 50 patents with my name on it. I don't get any money from it, but it's cool to tell people at dinner, dinner parties. Um, <clears throat> and then I reapplied and when I, or I applied for the first time to medical school. The first time I took my MCAT, I failed. Like you can't fail it, but yeah, you can, you can actually fail it. Um, I failed it and so I retook it and did much better. And when I applied, I got all, all the schools I applied to wanted to interview me, which was incredible because my grades weren't great, but I had tons of volunteer experience. Like I was like, I will show these people that I have a heart for service. And this is what I want to do is I want to help people. So, you know, I interviewed I, and San Antonio was my first choice and I got into medical school here. You know, along the way, I'll tell you that there were a lot of like amazing experiences. One of the most affirming experiences for, that, for me was um, an application that came out in an email when I was about six months into my 
first year as a medical student about a scholarship called the Lozano Long Scholarship. And when I read the, the criteria for the Lozano Long Scholarship, it was you come from an underserved area, your parents didn't have an education, um, you want to do primary care, and you want to serve South Texas. And I was like, I meet all of these. So I submitted an essay, and I didn't hear anything for about four months. I figured I didn't get it until I got called into the dean's office, which is a terrifying experience as a student because you're wondering what you did and if you're going to get kicked out for it. Um, and he told me that I got the scholarship. And I thought it was for one year. Um, and it turns out it was a full tuition paid for all of medical school for all four years. Um, and it was one of those things that I just felt like, again, God was putting me in the right place. And I knew that this is like, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to do this. Like, stop complaining about it and just do it. This is what you're meant to do. So medical school was incredible. Third year of medical school, I loved everything. I loved every rotation I did. I remember my, you know, the combat veteran in the VA psych ward who actually never saw combat experience, which is an interesting, you know, that's why he has a mental health issue. Um, I remember the um, doing a thoracotomy on a patient in an emergency department. I remember um, delivering a baby for the first time. I remember seeing a 23-week preemie for the first time. Um, and those experiences are amazing. And at, at the end of third year, <clears throat> they tell you to pick one. And I was like, pick one? How can I pick one thing and exclude everything else that you could do? And so it was very difficult for me and I, um, because I didn't know if I wanted to specialize or not. But as most people who meet me within about five minutes um, or see my shoes realize that I'm a pediatrician. <laughs> like, people knew that before I knew it. When I told my husband I wanted to do pediatrics, he was like, oh, you thought you were going to do something else? <laughs> That's funny. Um, so everybody knew that except for me. And when I finally made the decision, I knew that it was the right thing for me. So it was the patients on each rotation that I realized it was kids on every rotation that I gravitated towards. Um, I remember the teenager giving birth to her baby. She was 13 years old and her crying for her mom while she was delivering her own baby. That stuck with me. Um, I remember the teenage boy who took his parents' car for a joyride and rolled over and I held his beating heart in my hand. Um, he was beautiful and I'll never forget his face. Um, you know, these things stuck with me, and I knew that that's what I was called to do. So, if I ha so I feel like I'm in the right place. I feel like I'm doing what I was called to do, which is beautiful, and every single one of these people feel like that too, which is wonderful. If I had some pearls of advice, um, what I would tell you is that it's really, really easy to get burnt out, and really, what happens really quickly, actually, I attended a wellness conference for residents and students recently, and statistics show that within the first like two years of medical school, a lot of students report that the joy and the passion that they felt for going into medicine, they have a difficult time remembering it, and they already start to feel um, feelings towards their patients of um, like negative feelings or judgmental feelings. And I went through a period of that. I think most people do. And some of it's protective for you because it's a lot emotionally to go through. But I think it's really important to remember, like everyone kind of said here, try and remember why you picked what you picked and all the different signs that you felt as you went, you know, as you went through this journey to get where you were going. And be kind to yourself. Actively seek out a support group. If your family doesn't live here, then seek out people who you can spend time with, that you can talk to, um, because those things are the things that get you through the really hard times when you wonder if this is really, if you really have the strength and the fortitude to do what you want to do. Um, the truth is, and the evidence shows that that healthcare providers who are burnout and healthcare providers who um, are stressed and overworked and aren't kind to themselves, they aren't kind to their patients and their patient's health ends up suffering and their patients end up feeling like they see it. They know you're not there um, mentally and emotionally. So the best way to take care of your patients is take care of yourself. And um, as much as you can, hold on to the purpose that you have in, um, in what brought you here. You will see thousands of patients in your lifetime and you will forget their name within hours of, them, of meeting them. But they won't forget your name. 
They won't forget the interaction they had with you. You will be a part of one of the more, most painful or traumatic experiences for them. So remember that it's very personal to your patient. So showing up to work every day um, and trying to remember what brought you there and giving them that t peace, that just that little moment of eye contact and sitting down and listening to them really goes a very long way in helping to make a really horrible experience one for the better. So um, thank you for inviting me. I feel incredibly humbled that you had asked me to give this talk today. Thank you.